Hey there everyone, Remy McNeil here of Celtic Phoenix Productions. What you're about to watch is a reformatted version of one of the videos that's already on my channel, Fixing Ruby Part 3, Volume 1. This video was originally about an hour, 10, hour, 15 minutes in length, if I'm recalling correctly, and not a lot of people had the chance to actually sit down and watch it all the way through. And by popular demand, I decided to actually sit down and split up the entire video into smaller episodic chunks, which, the first part of which you're watching now. Um, so if that explains some of the sudden endings, uh, this is actually the video itself just cut up and reformatted for a smaller version. It's not necessarily a one-to-one -one redo of the entire thing. Um, future installments of the series, part five going forward, will actually have this format in mind. Uh, but parts three and four are getting this dicing treatment, and I hope you guys find it more approachable than the long, hour-long videos that I've already been doing. Uh, so without further ado, welcome to Fixing Ruby, part three, and I hope you enjoy. <laughs> Well, we finally made it, haven't we? I say that like it's an accomplishment when really we're only now actually covering the series proper two installments in. Now, you might be wondering if I'm going to be covering the trailers, which fluctuate in canonicity, and I decided that instead of covering them separately, I'm just going to tackle them here before getting into the main segments of the series. Now, if there's one thing I can credit Ruby, it's that the trailers before the series actually aired were pretty damn engrossing and raised plenty of questions that would be touched upon later in the series. The only downside of this is that many of these elements don't really come into any kind of fruition until two or three volumes after the first. I think the only major things that played out into anything immediate were the assault on the train introducing Blake's detachment from the White Fang and Roman briefly showing up in the yellow trailer. Still, the trailers are for the most part just fine, so the only tweaks I'll make are relatively minor. First is the white trailer, where at the end, among the clapping crowd, we get a glimpse of Jacques, Winter, and maybe even Whitley. It just has to be partial, but getting something like an uneasy glance from Weiss and a nod of approval from Jacques would help to contextualize that the royal test in Mirror Mirror is a more familial burden and not a strictly social one. Not a major change, but one that could help viewers more quickly understand Weiss's predicament starting out. The red trailer doesn't really need to be touched on, and it's easily the simplest of the bunch. The only addendum I'm going to throw in there is that the Grimm that Ruby fights are young fledglings, indicated by their lack of bony carapace. This allows her pre-show power level to actually take them all on. I'm tempted to also make her arguably a little more winded during the fight to show some struggle to keep up with the amassed odds. The yellow trailer has a few adjustments to it so that Yang doesn't come out of it with an arrest warrant like she should have in the original. The biggest change comes when she's picking Junior's brain at the beginning of the trailer. See, she's insistent that he knows something about the woman in her photo. After telling her he doesn't know anything, instead of grabbing him by the balls, she instead playfully flicks to the next picture on her phone, which just so happens to be a picture that she took coming in of him and Roman having a conversation. She threatens to forward the photo to the police and the media if she doesn't get the answer she wants. In turn, Junior orders one of his guards to take her phone, at which point she breaks the guy's arm. This kind of keys him into that maybe she's a huntress combined with the fact that she's armed, and Junior orders the club to empty and for all his guards to close in, clearing the room of witnesses. As he and Yang begin to circle, the rest of the trailer plays out normally. At the very end, after knocking Junior out of the building, Yang straddles him, demanding answers only to realize he's out cold. She drops him to the ground, saying he's useless before running into Ruby, and the trailer ends as normal. This addition helps ease a few issues and establish some facts about the world. 
that Junior appears to be an upstanding businessman who has a reputation to keep publicly, that Roman Torchwick is a major criminal element powerful enough to damage that reputation, that Yang cares less about the law and more about getting what she wants, and that she's streetwise enough to know how to play in the deeper end of Vale's criminal underbelly. She's smart, resourceful, more capable in a fight, and quick on the draw, which meshes well with the sweet, flirty, dumb blonde veneer she puts on. Most importantly though, this gives us reason for the fight sequence beyond. Well, honestly, there really wasn't one besides Yang just deciding to kick the shit out of some dudes for no reason. That was a more substantive change, but the largest change that'll leave the most impact from these changes in the full context of the show comes in the Black trailer. When the trailer starts, the first thing we see is Blake as she was in the original version, sans one thing, her signature bow. In the original version, Blake wearing her bow at this point always confused me as it raised a number of questions about how exactly she was hiding her identity from the White Fang when Adam saw her with the bow on before she left. And because he didn't comment on it during the first trailer, I think it's safe to assume that this was a normal ensemble for her, so if the White Fang would try to find her, they probably could do so without much effort. Hell, considering how few characters wear a bow and have dark hair, it arguably makes her easier to identify. By having her don the bow at the end of the trailer as she's out of eyeshot from Adam, it makes a more convincing disguise. This also changes the dynamic between Blake and the audience during the first volume. We are now in the know of a new fact that all the other characters aren't, allowing us to contextualize Blake's behavior on the fly instead of in retrospect. Now, let it be known that I liked Blake's reveal in Volume 1, it being one of the best setup reveals in the series, but I feel that Doing this not only avoids those pesky little plot holes, but also opens up new forms of tension and dynamic to explore when we finally arrive at Beacon. Speaking of which... Probably one of the most important changes I'm implementing is the complete shirking of the idea of volumes and instead implementing a more traditional season format consisting of about 20 10-minute episodes apiece, which pushes the series' runtime to be just shy of a normal 12 or 13 episode anime season. This gives us a little more breathing room to make changes, and we know that Roots Teeth is able to produce a show on this scale thanks to Red vs. Blue. This change, however, is not just to give us more time to work with, it's also a move to refine our focus in the show. One of the bigger issues Ruby has is that its volumes don't really tell their own internal story. To quote Fat Man Falling, The biggest problem with Ruby Volume 1 is that there isn't a plot. By making the volumes into seasons, we set a very clear message that there will be a main plot thread that concludes at the end of the 20 episode run, while also leaving enough threads and ideas open for future expansion instead of just the smattering of small story arcs we got instead. Now also keep in mind that this is a very rough overview and I'm going to be hitting a lot of points that are going to be changed from the original material. At the same time there's going to be background details and ad-libs that I don't touch on, and in fact it may seem like some places that there's not enough to go into filling a whole 10 minute episode. A lot of those kinds of details will be fleshed out in the individual episode scripts, but if I tried to do that this entire video would go on way too long and take roughly 5 months to produce what with all the additional writing and editing that I have to do. So in the sense of getting this to you guys in a timely fashion and out before Volume 5 airs, please allow me a little bit of slack with the details. As always, if you feel I've missed something important or something doesn't quite add up, please, please leave a comment down below and I'll do my damnedest to address it in the follow-up video. So Season 1 begins without any introduction or preamble, instead cutting out all the narration by Jen Taylor and skipping right to the events of the show proper. Torchwick, in the same way as the original canon, is wordlessly shown to be a powerhouse of charisma, trading his way to the dust shop with his goons completely unopposed. Intimidating, confident, and suave, he makes his demands of the shop owner, wanting the cash but also demanding every ounce of dust the shop has to offer, saying it'll be more valuable than the piddling amounts of Lien in the cash register. This, along with the way the dust is retrieved and stored by the goons, will give the audience an indication of the value of dust. Of course, then comes the fateful moment when one of the goons tries to hold up Ruby and the fight from episode 1 unfolds as normal until Roman steps in. He's quick to overpower Ruby, but before he can make a dry quip and finish her, Glinda appears and fights him, easily turning the tides against him. Desperate, he reaches into one of the dust cases and uses one of the crystals to cause an explosive distraction to slip away. Cut forward and Ruby is interrogated by Ozpin and Goodwitch, with her admittance in the beacon secured thanks to a rather adept work she did during the fight. The end of the episode proceeds as it once did, only it's simply some extended interactions between Ruby and Yang as they discuss Ruby's anxiety over being two years everyone's junior. 
but ultimately concluding with Ruby hyping over seeing Beacon come up on the horizon. Already, thanks to context clues, demonstration, and behaviors, the audience has an idea of the relative power levels between each character and their status in the setting, giving them a nice idea of where the protagonist stands and how far they have the potential to go. Episode 2 will start with a news report by Lisa Lavender talking about the White Fang, which was originally at the end of Episode 1. This helps to frontload the necessary exposition about the Faunus instead of backloading it like the original first episode did, and contextualize the confrontation between Blake and Weiss with a much greater scope. You could even have Blake on the airship with them, in the background, reacting to the report with frustration or remorse, or some combination of the two. Because, you see, we the audience know she's a Faunus, and this will help us understand more of what happened back in the Black trailer. Glenda gives her little speech during the approach, and we can even have the gag with John vomiting into a nearby trash can to get an early visual establishment of him as a character. This is all followed by Yang giving Ruby the slip as she did initially, though her friends group is going to at least have some visual definition, as later in the season they're going to have some plot relevance. In response, Ruby groans about having to handle their luggage on their own. While struggling to tear the bags free, she accidentally knocks over Weiss's bags, covering herself in red dust. Weiss enters and gets indignant, both with Ruby and with her staff for putting the bags in the public pool instead of just taking them straight to the main hall. Ruby sneezes, she and Weiss explode, and Blake does her best catfight routine on Weiss's pride. In retrospect, the original version of the scene was actually pretty good with delivering a hefty amount of exposition in a short amount of time while also keeping it diegetic, relevant and easy to absorb. By simply adding some of the few previously mentioned elements, such as the baggage pool and the news report, we've shorn up some of the lazy writing contrivances that led to this conversation while also keeping the idea of the faunus and the racism against them fresh in the viewer's mind. So kudos to Miles and Carrie, this rather important scene, at least from a basic narrative standpoint, was already effective. Things proceed normally from there, what with Ruby meeting John and Ospin giving his speech, though Ospin's language is also going to be far more foreboding regarding the grim and the threat they pose. After that is a brief little segment with Tortric returning to his base of operations. He's in a terrible mood after that robbery's near-complete failure. He goes to a more lavishly decorated room, and we're introduced to Neo, who is currently sick and bedridden with an unspecified illness. Roman checks to see if she's doing better, to which she nods, and he responds somewhat warmly, noting that he's got something big planned and he'll need her by his side in order to make it work. He looks at the full moon, and we transition back to Beacon, where the remaining bulk of the episode focuses on the nighttime shenanigans at the school, which formally introduces many of the characters to each other, and is of course the first time all of Team Ruby is in the same place together. This goes on to establish a lot of important dynamics. Ruby and Blake bond somewhat over books, but their differing views on heroism. Yang's almost immediate dismissal of Blake as a lost cause, but similarly her desire to have Ruby make new friends. And it reaffirms the friction between Weiss, Ruby, and Yang. Episode 3 begins, and it flows smoothly into the initiation arc, what with introducing the two best characters in the show, Pyrrha and her fame, and setting up the dynamic between John, Pyrrha, and Weiss that'll carry somewhat into Season 2. In addition, we get a small introduction for Cardin, who will be playing a larger role in this season than he did previously, and indeed will have his own share of focus in the near future. But for now, he simply blows past John, and we get a good impression that he's kind of an ass. When we get to the launch pads, Ospin explains the scenario and rules that go into the initiation, that they have to link up with a partner through locking eyes, find a relic, and get to the predetermined location programmed on a map on their scrolls that'll activate once they get said relics. But there's a key difference here. There are no Grimm in the forest, at least not that anyone is aware. Yes, the major threats this time around are simply violent wildlife that inhabit the forest. Wolves, bears, a few unique creatures to remnant like squirrel-chimpanzee hybrid creatures, and amphibious crocodile monsters that dot the forest. This is done in order to play up the threat of the Grimm. After all, if the students can't take on a normal brown bear, how are they expected to take on an Ursa? One of the students will of course raise the question of how Grimm are being kept out, but Osman cuts him off by beginning the initiation. As with before, everyone is quickly launched out into the forest. Episodes 4 through 6 are the remainder of the initiation with all the appropriate pairs coming together. Ruby and Weiss, Blake and Yang, John and Pyrrha, Ren and Nora, and new to the paradigm Cardin and Russell, which goes to show Cardin's domineering presence and ability to pressure people. 
In addition, we get cuts to Ozpin who is not only monitoring the situation, but also artificially manipulating the forest in order to ensure certain pairs come together, a la how the operators manipulate the arena and the Hunger Games. Ruby, Weiss, John, and Pyrrha's first meeting occurs as normal, though instead of it being Beowulves that attack Weiss, it's regular wolves. Yang and Blake are slightly different though. Their meeting happens just as it did before, with Black Bears and Otohursai, but a later scene shows the two grinding against each other's nerves, in particular when Yang's boisterous nature ends up startling a few of those squirrel chimpanzee monsters I mentioned earlier. This ends up forcing the two of them to flee towards the temple in response, and the creatures rampage through the rest of the forest. Blake is of course pissed by this, and instead of yelling, gives Yang the cold shoulder as they approach the temple. Yang does most of the talking here, noting how some of the relics are already gone, and even though she's still mad, Blake has no choice but to crack a small, short smile at Yang's pony line, showing the first inklings of more chemistry beyond their personality conflicts. Meanwhile, with Ruby and Weiss, the two discover the Nevermore sleeping in a rather old, tattered tree. The two are shocked at finding a Grimm, especially one so old, as Weiss points out, here in the forest when Osmond said there wouldn't be any. The two decide to avoid it, but are suddenly forced to flee towards it as the squirrel chimpanzees that Yang had stirred up come rampaging towards them. This in turn leads to Ruby's crazy idea to latch onto the Nevermore and ride it, which brings them to the temple in short order. Meanwhile, meanwhile, John and Pira have their explanation of Aura, and this is the first point where we have Pira confused by John's lack of knowledge on the matter. He brushes it off and they move along. During this, of course, is Ren sneaking around a King Taijitsu, which can hear him but cannot see him. Even with how quiet he is, it flails violently and he gets knocked into a tree, flaring his aura to demonstrate Pira's point. He's only rescued by Nora, who drives by on a bear and kills one of the King Taijitsu's heads before picking up Ren and running into the distance. John and Pira run into Cardin and Russell, who are observing the cave thinking it might lead them to the relics. Cardin, being a douche, decides to manipulate John and Pira into the cave so they can act like canaries in a coal mine. Pun not intended. But I'm writing this, and I'm leaving it in, does that mean it's still unintended? Or, you know what, screw it, let's just move on. Of course, this leaves John and Pira to go in the cave, and after not hearing from them for a little while, Cardin and Russell move on, only to run into Ren, Nora, and the King Taijitsu that chases them all off towards the temple. The chase ends when the squirrel chimps temporarily cross the King Taijitsu's path and forces it to change directions from its prey, giving Ren, Nora, Cardin, and Russell some breathing room to get their relics. Back in the cave, John and Pira come across a Deathstalker, and things proceed as they did before, with John getting flung and Pira being chased. Finally, all of the different characters converge and we come to the first major climax of the season. John and Ruby retrieve their respective relics, Pira comes breaking through the tree line with the Deathstalker in tow, and everyone prepares to get the hell out of the forest. The problem, they all realize? The evac site is beyond the all three massive Grimm stalking them. With their only path blocked, Ruby leads the charge by running past Pira to attack the Deathstalker. She almost gets herself killed, but Yang and Weiss manage to save her. While this is happening, John notices the ruins and explains that if they lure the Grimm to the ruins, the ten of them will have a better collective chance of circumventing the monsters and making a break for the evac site. They all make a run for the temple, barely fending off the three monsters as they go, and during it we get a glimpse of both Ruby and John keeping an eye on the people around them. This comes into play when they get cornered at the temple instead. Weiss begins shouting out orders for people to take, trying to gather a plan, but Ruby, who has a clear understanding of people's abilities at this point, disagrees. During their argument, Russell, the only person to actually listen to Weiss's setup plan, gets injured and is barely rescued in time by Blake. Meanwhile, the bridge falls through and what will become Juniper are stranded on the opposite side of the gorge with Cardin, the King Taijitsu, and the Deathstalker. While John manages to coordinate with Pira, Ren, and Nora, Cardin manages to solo the somewhat weakened King Taijitsu and take it out, displaying his raw talent for being a huntsman right out of the gate. Across the way, Ruby decides she's not taking any more shit and figuratively sits Weiss, Blake, and Yang down to explain her plan, at the end of which the Nevermore manages to circle back and destroys the last of the upper portion of the temple, and Team Ruby finally leaps into action to deliver the killing blow. Now, with more organization and a crazy plan behind them, of which only Ruby and Yang are confident in, the team gets into position, and Ruby's banter with Weiss about taking the shot shows how they too have more positive chemistry that's been buried by mistake and circumstance. Boom! Ruby kills the Nevermore, and across the way, Team Juniper manages to kill the Deathstalker. Ruby strikes a heroic pose at the top of the cliff, and the scene cuts to Ospin and Glinda watching the events unfold. They converse about how they should not have been any Grimm in the forest and the ruins should have been keeping the Grimm out. 
Glinda, though upset, remarks that it was only a matter of time before the ruin's ability to repel the Grimm ceased working. Ozpin, however, sees something more foreboding than just chance at play. With that, we fade into the team's coronation ceremony, where Team Cardinal has just been announced being led by Cardin. Juniper is then called forward and formed, and John is announced as its leader, prompting Nora to slap his back and Pira to put a proud hand on his shoulder, though he himself looks incredibly uneasy about it. Lastly is of course Team Ruby, led by Ruby Rose, which leads to Weiss staring in horrified disbelief. Blake simply has her eyebrow perked, and Yang has a brief, uneasy look on her face before congratulating her sister and giving her a hug. The last scene of the initiation arc is somewhat unchanged from before, with Roman planning the next stage of his heist back at his hideout. Though the significant tweak is that he notes that the cops are closing in on their operation. He figures they're going to need a distraction, something to throw the cops off their trail, and he casually thumbs through a news article about the Vital Festival and its financing coming from around the globe. When he gets to the next page, he sees an article about the White Fang, which prompts him to pause before smiling. Thank you for watching section 1 of Fixing Ruby Part 3. I'd love to give a big shout out to all of my wonderful patrons who have each helped this channel grow into what it is today. If you want to support the channel, please consider donating at patreon.com slash Phoenix. Remember, by donating $1 or more you can get access to the Team Frostbite Discord server where personalities like myself, Fatman Falling, and Tom Horan of Six Lick Productions regularly interact with our supporters. Please stick around for the next installment, and I'll catch you all on the flip side.